Okay, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for our, the MSP Ignite Resource Network webinar series. Uh, this series has continued throughout the year. And as always, we're excited to be bringing the series to our members and invited guests. All of the presenters in this series throughout the year have made a commitment to provide our membership with actionable insight into areas that can help them grow or otherwise impact their bottom line in a positive way. Now, before we dive in, I should go ahead and answer the most popular question we receive every single time we do a webinar. And that is, yes, we are recording this. Um, you'll all receive an email after the webinar with a copy of the slides and a link to the MSP Ignite YouTube channel where you'll be able to watch the presentation again. We also suggest you subscribe once you're in that YouTube channel. That way, every time we put something out there, some content out there, you'll be notified that it's there and you don't have to ask or go looking for it. Um, everyone will remain muted during the presentation. However, please use the Q&A button to ask questions along the way. Um, now, normally this is when I thank our sponsor and introduce our sponsor. It's also the time many of you tune out and say, I'll wait until the speaker comes on. Uh, we've got, we had some logistical issues with our sponsor this time around. So I was told that MSP Ignite is indeed your sponsor. That seems a little odd given that at least half of the people on this call are already members of MSP Ignite. So I decided to do something that I did for a webinar just yesterday, and that is talk about some peer group observations. These are things that we hear either as the mistakes that we find most people make or the reasons that those of you that are very successful are as successful as you are. And those of you that are members, it will not be surprising to see this first one come up. Financials, financials, financials. I always find that when I look for the difference between the highly successful MSP and the MSP that's struggling to get to the next level or to jump the next plateau, it's all about the numbers and it's about the understanding of the numbers. Obviously, those of you that are members know we ask you for benchmarking numbers. We are constantly working on, on trying to refine that. We've got some exciting news coming up soon uh, about another way to refine that and some things we're looking at. But when I say financials, I do not mean look at your P&L once a month. I mean much more than that. As a matter of fact, yesterday I was working with someone that said they've told their accountant they want to see the P&L once a month and the accountant told them, no, I'll give it to you once a quarter. By the way, my response was you need a new accountant. I think it's pretty straightforward. But I'm, I'm talking about looking deep into your financials, understanding where the profits are coming from, where the cost centers are growing, where the trends are going. Do you have a client that's losing money, losing you profit margin little by little, month over month? Why? What's going on? We need to go talk to that client and figure out why or evaluate and figure out why. All right. The next one, and this is really, we all shoot ourselves in the foot and my staff that's on here will understand that I do it too. Um, we need to go out and hire talented people and then we allow, need to allow them to be human beings. We need to allow them to make mistakes. We need to let them learn on the job and then guide them towards the correction and not jump in all the time. Um, in other words, we need to actually delegate and let them do the work or we will never grow our organizations. It's something that I feel very strongly about. We all do this to a point and then we jump in every time we see something as owners or managers, those of you that are managers, all right? The next observation I, I make and I talked about quite a bit yesterday was that vendors should not dictate your business strategy. And I understand that many of you are engineers that grew into business owners, some of you very successful, some of you wish you were more successful. I, I can tell you that planning is the biggest reason that you shoot yourself in the foot. And more often than not, it's because we follow our vendors rather than creating a strategy and then picking vendors to fit it. Um, this is a huge conversation that we can have, certainly in peer group, uh, any of you in your upcoming meetings wanna bring this one up, we can go deeper and deeper into this one, All right? But, uh, Choose your strategy first, then find the vendor, instead of having a vendor dictate what your business strategy should be, right? Uh, the next one about always be adding value. 
this really comes down to account management. And those of you on the call that are smaller and don't have dedicated account managers, you know that account management is something that you, you wear the hat, but you also wear seven other hats, which means account management is not really strategic. It's not really a plan. It's more reactionary than proactive. If you think of the model we talk about with our clients about proactive IT support, um, account management should be a proactive game not a reactive game. Reactive means, means you're reacting to a complaint or a need that the client brought to your attention. Proactive means you're actually making sure there are no complaints ahead of time and you're actually telling the clients what they should be thinking about rather than reacting the other way around, all right? So account management with a strategy and a plan, huge, huge point that, that many are missing and need to focus on. Along those same lines, Business development, especially especially now, you know, through we're, we're five, six months, six months into quarantine or into COVID, five months into quarantine. Some of you have lost a little bit of market share. Luckily, at least for MSP Ignite members, most have not lost a massive amount of market share, but everyone's lost something. And I'm hearing people over and over and over again say, I need sales, I need sales. I need to go hire somebody. I need to go hire a salesperson. I need to go hire one of our partners to do marketing or sales for us. But it is always knee jerk and reactive in nature rather than slow, methodical, and with a plan. And, and I'm going to tell you that business development, growing your business just doesn't work that way. It, it doesn't grow in that light. Now, as I said, we're the sponsors and the hosts of this session. So, I have to throw up a little bit of a commercial and I'm not going to make this necessarily about MSP Ignite. Those of you on the call that are not part of a peer group, these are some of the things that if we opened up the, the phone, so, so to speak, and let everybody talk, our peer group members would tell you, these are some of the benefits to joining a peer group. These are some of the reasons you want to join. We'd love to talk to you about it after this call or at any time down the road to talk to you about how we can help you grow your business and how you can jump in to a, to a peer group with us, all right? So that's the end of the sponsor time for today. I'm gonna make it really nice and easy for you. That's actually the end of the sponsor time. Um, our keynote today, um, he's been with us before, is Justin Reinmuth, of C is CEO and founder of TechRug, the Technology Risk Underwriting Group. And it's not often we say this about insurance, but, it, but when Justin is on, insurance is fascinating and it is so key and integral to your business, right? Um, since 2004, Justin and his team have had the responsibility of managing risk and creating policies for over 16,000 IT companies in areas such as cyber liability, errors and emissions insurance, management liability insurance, commercial crime insurance, and business owners insurance. So Justin, I'm gonna turn this over to you and, and let you dazzle us with the talk of cybersecurity. <laughs> insurance. Well, Steve, I, I appreciate the introduction and um, I appreciate everyone on this uh, Wednesday summer day joining the call to talk about insurance. Uh, hopefully we'll try to keep it as interesting as possible and I, I promise that, uh, you know, I'll try not to go over 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, I am going to include our director of risk management, John Campanile. Uh, just I wanted him to be on the call to provide some insight because he has a little bit more interaction with our clients on day-to-day -day activities in terms of not only managing risk, but transferring uh, risk and mitigating risk as much as you can in this environment. So I'm going to be, uh, he'll be on this call here and, and, and provide some insight. So with that being said, again, I want to thank everyone for joining and I'll kind of jump right to this. Um, I think, so. oh, there we go, sorry. All right, I apologize, the uh, buttons aren't showing up very clear on my There we go, whoever took control, thank you. All right, um, so these are just a couple of links that I wanna put, I mean, I'm sure most of the people on the call obviously know what's going on in the industry. Um, you know, up until pre-COVID times, um, you know, MSPs were growing at, at a nice clip. I mean, we obviously see revenues and people where they were last year compared to this year. Um, and I still think, you know, even in talking with clients, as Steve said, yeah, has everyone taken a little bit of a hit? But when this whole thing started, I thought it was gonna be a lot messier than what it is. I'm amazed at the number of clients and we're going through a renewal that are either saying, yeah, you know, I am down some or 
I'm as good as I was last year, or some are even doing better. Um, and so, you know, with everything that's going on in this environment, I think that A, you know, it shows that MSPs, I don't want to say they're necessarily recession proof, but what the services that you're offering are needed by clients. And, you know, but with that has obviously come, you know, just some increased exposure and a ton of liability over the last 18 months to two years. Uh, you know, we've just found that these bad actors say, you know, hey, is it easier to go after, you know, 10 chiropractic offices and try to, you know, hit them individually and, and, and get into the network and do damage? Or is it easier to go after one MSP and cause havoc to all of their customers? And just the trend right now is the latter. So, you know, I just wanted to include here some links. Again, this shouldn't be surprising to the majority of the people on the call. But, you know, I wanted to pick some that were kind of non- uh, insurance related links so that you could see from vendors or the United States Secret Service kind of again what was going on in the industry you know the exposure the liability that's out there and then we're going to get into this call about hopefully how we can you know work on mitigating some of that I apologize Steve or whoever on my end it's just not clicking these buttons there we go um, so any more, right, you know, over the last couple of years, um, this is just my opinion. Insurance can't be the only solution to, or, or I guess a version of what you would call risk management, right? Um, there's a couple key components, and I know on the last call we kind of touched upon these, um, but I just wanted to revisit it because I can't tell you how important it is. I mean, if, if you're on this call and your solution to, you know, mitigating risk in this environment is a million dollar E&O insurance policy. It, it probably isn't enough. I mean, I was just reading, uh, and it, maybe it's been out there a while, but I was reading uh, the other day, it was a, a joint um, study point out, or, uh, put out by Ninja RMM, and I think, I believe it was Coveware. Um, but basically, you know, a lot of it just talked about kind of, you know, the perception of what a ransomware attack was like and what it actually is like. But one of the things that they highlighted was that, and I believe the number was 35% uh, that they surveyed did not have cyber liability errors and omissions insurance. And then the other 20, 25-ish percent uh, had either, or had, you know, 250, 500,000 or million dollar limits. So they were under that million dollars. So, you know, 50 to 55% of the MSPs either A, didn't carry cyber errors and omissions insurance, or B, they had limits that were under a million dollars. In that report of people that had actually been hit, they pointed out that the financial damages were in excess of a million dollars. Um, so, and again, I'll get into this in the insurance call, is we're having more calls about limits as opposed to coverages, but it's telling you that, you know, 50 to 55% of the people out there that don't carry insurance or carry limits under a million dollars, uh, you're not, you're probably not properly protected in this environment. And that's, something that you really got to pay attention to because in terms of limits, two mil is a new one mil if you're going to start in your $550,000. And we're seeing clients that are, you know, 10, 20, 30 million, you know, they used to carry two and three million. Now they're carrying five and 10 million. So uh, there's definitely been a trend to increasing the limits as they talk to peers or they read about uh, situations where MSPs have been hit. And years ago, the ransom started at 60 or 80,000. You know, now they're hundreds of thousands into the millions of dollars just for, you know, the ransomware payment. I haven't even gotten into forensics, third-party business interruption lawsuits, things like that. So, you know, in order to make sure that you are able to survive something like that, I think there's three things that really need to be in place. So the first one is going to be protection. And when I say protection, that's both a, both a first-party comment and a third-party comment. So when I say first-party I'm talking about you as MSPs, you know, making sure that you are doing everything necessary internally to, to stay secure. Um, when a client or a prospect applies for coverage with TechRug, uh, we've done it for the last five years. Not only do we take them through an application process, but we take them through a risk assessment process. And um, we have a risk management firm that goes through each assessment and gives feedback. So I'd asked them, uh, it was probably six, seven months ago, uh, right before you know, all this COVID stuff happened, I asked them to kind of keep track of, you know, how many, give me three buckets. How many MSPs were, hey, there's no pushback, they're doing everything really well. How many of them are, hey, we got to get away, these people are higher hazard, uh, they're, they're probably not a good risk for tech rug. And how many people is there, you know, some ping pong back and forth, like, 
hey, I see they're doing this. Either ask them this question or find out more detail. I see they're not doing that. They need to be doing this. And so they reported back to me that just under 40%, so we'll just call it 40%, were clean submissions, meaning that they felt that they were doing everything internally correct up until that point of time that they could possibly do it. That leaves 60% of the people, either there was some ping pong back and forth in terms of, hey, you're not quite doing the things you need to be doing, or you aren't doing it, you need to switch these things, or you're just too high hazard for us. And you know, some of the questions that we get, or a lot of the calls that we field anymore, are MSPs that are coming to us because either A, they've been dropped by their current carrier, B, the carrier said, hey, we used to charge you $1,000, forget two or $3,000, we're now going to charge you four or $5,000. Or C, I'm an $11 million MSP, I carry 2 million limits. With everything going on, I want to carry 5 million limits, and I can't get to 5 million because my carrier won't go above 2. And I would think, and just me personally, until that number for, goes from 40% to 80%, you know, in terms of, you know, hey, these people are doing everything right, this MSP is great, they're up to date with everything, I don't know if this is going to stop. So, you know, making sure that, again, internally everything is buttoned up and secure, I think to me security equals sales anymore because if you have other MSPs that aren't doing the right thing and they're getting hit, I can tell you I've been on these ransomware attacks, 10 to 45% of your clients aren't going to put up with it. They're going to leave. So they got to go somewhere. And if you could stay secure while these other people are getting picked off, you're going to start picking up two clients here, three clients there. It adds up real quick. The other part of protection I want to focus on in this is where, you know, especially with, you know, since, you know, we started the, 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 the COVID situation, you know, obviously we have, you know, our, our clients that are, or your clients that are working more from home um, between, you know, the kind of the PPP phishing scams, the COVID phishing scams, the work from home exposures. Uh, we've actually seen the risk getting worse in terms of cyber attacks. And we're seeing your clients because they don't know, and I get it. They don't know what tomorrow's looks like. They don't want to spend an extra dollar on IT security services, but they should be and they need to because with the work from home exposure and what we've seen in terms of, you know, clients that might not be getting security awareness training, you know, they're falling for cyber crime uh, claims. They're falling for, you know, phishing scams at a greater rate that we've seen at least over this five or six months than they were before. Well, if you guys aren't recommending that the client follows a standard and something goes wrong, I don't care if it's NIST, ISO, COVID, you pick it. But if we get to a point and we go to court and the judge on the, or I'm sorry, the attorney on the other side pulls you up in front of the, you know, the court and asks you, hey, John, how did you, or why did you recommend the solutions that you recommended for my client? Either A, you better have you know, have testified on Capitol Hill or have a, a series of credentials after your name, or B, you got to follow a standard. Because if they point out that, hey, the accounting firm down the street had 2FA on their email and a backup that was inaccessible from the network and my accounting client didn't, why do you have them do it and not my client? You're going to be in trouble, you know? So you got to make sure, you know, that your client's are following a standard. To me, it almost kind of reminds me of, you know, in a, in, a, in a good way to do it is, you know, when you go to, uh, you know, pick up a prescription at the pharmacy, you know, when the pharmacist hands you that prescription, it's in a bag. On the outside of that bag stapled is a pamphlet. When you open up that pamphlet, that pamphlet tells you, A, exactly what the drug does or is intended to do, and B, it lists the 9,000 side effects. That's, to me, is, you know, when, a, when you're working with a client, you got to hand them the pamphlet. Now, when you get home and you peel open the bag and you pull out the pill bottle, on the pill bottle on the side, it says common side effects include nausea, dizziness, you know, whatever it may be. They'll list three or four things. That maybe is working with your client on their budget, right? Saying, okay, well, you know, chasing this probably is like chasing infinity, right? But it doesn't still absolve you from the liability of recommending that they follow that standard. You know, you wouldn't find a doctor that's going to treat someone with stage four cancer veering off the AMA guidelines. If they do, they're probably going to get sued. And same with you guys. You got to make sure that you're following that standard. But within that standard, i.e. on the side of the pill bottle, you can point out three or four things that they really need to pay attention to. Because the number of notice of circumstance, what a notice of circumstance means, it's not quite a claim, but our MSPs are calling us up and saying, hey, XYZ law firm or PDQ accounting firm, 
they were either subject to a business email compromise or they sent $90,000 to someone they shouldn't have. They don't have a cyber policy. Guess what? They might be coming after us. We've seen an uptick in notice of circumstances. So that's what I mean by protection. It has to be both first party, the MSP, and third party, making sure you're working with your clients to follow a standard. If they're not following a standard, get a critical action or waiver letter signed. Blame the insurance company. The next thing I want to focus on is, is insurance. Um, you know, kind of as I alluded to before, and I, I know we talked about this, those of you who were on the call before, I think the biggest thing to take away is that these E&O policies are unregulated. Uh, I only got two hands, but I can't count the number of times that uh, somebody will call me and say, hey, I'd like to switch over, but before switching over, can you tell me how your cyber policy differs from mine? And I'll look at it and there'll be no insuring agreement for cyber extortion. And I'll ask them, what are the two things that keep you up at night? 99.9% .9 of the people always give me a ransomware attack or some sort of client data loss. So when I point out that they don't have you know, cyber extortion to pay the ransom, you know, their comment is, well, why do I have the policy? But you know, when they're coming to us saying, well, yeah, I've got a cyber ENO policy, I guess they're calling that cyber ENO. I personally wouldn't call it cyber ENO, but they are. So it's, it's, it's still an unregulated pro product. I think the carriers are doing better um, at, you know, kind of, I don't want to say upping their game, but making it a little bit more standardized, but we're not there yet. It's not like an auto insurance policy or workers comp policy, you know, something that, you know, again, auto, it doesn't matter whether you're with Progressive, Allstate, or Geico. If you wreck your three-year-old Honda, they're going to give you the value of the three-year-old Honda. Workers comp. If you have one of your techs get hurt on the job and they got to go to urgent care, they're going to pay that bill. Those are more regulated. These are still unregulated policies. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the call, you know, just making sure in terms of insurance, A, you got the correct insuring agreements, and I'll review five of them where we see most of the claims, but making sure that you guys are going through an exercise determining what are the proper limits for you. You know, going through the underwriting process with our clients, I tell them, I can do 60% of my job but 20% still lies on your shoulders and 20% on either of our shoulders. The 20% that's on the MSP shoulders is, you know, go on hoovers.com, go on DMB, take your clients. How big are your clients? You know, some people might say, well, I only got three clients. Well, those three clients are hedge funds that do $4 billion and they're shut down for a week. That's a pretty big claim as opposed to someone who's got a hundred bakeries that do a million dollars each per year. So, you know, going through that exercise and determining how much, how many you know, uh, clients you got and how much, I guess I'm gonna say assets under management or clients under management do you have? Is it 100 million? Is it 200 million? Is it 300 million? Because God forbid they're shut down for a week and let's say that you know, represents 20% of your client base. If that number is $100 million and they're down for a week, we're looking at a $2 million claim just in third party business interruptions. So you can see, again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, you know, in, in my opinion, even for the smaller MSPs, $2 million has got to be the starting point. And the last one is, is you know, contracts. You know, making sure that you are using a solid MSA, and we talked a little bit about some of these templates like, you know, critical action letters and waiver letters for clients that don't want to follow your advice because, you know, with the correct MSA, I've seen hundreds of lawsuits in 14 years. And the well-run MSPs that have the right agreements we can make $90,000 become nine, or I'm sorry, $900,000 become $90,000 claims. And I'm going to bring John here in a second because John's task on these new submissions that come through is he's looking at these contracts going, when he reports back to our team, hey, if we get into a situation, is the attorney on the other side going to be licking their chops to get us into court or mediation because they know they got us? Or are they going to look to their client and go, you really want to spend $100,000 getting $50,000 out of this MSP? Maybe it's time to move on. Also, a well-written contract is going to keep you away from nuisance claims. You know, nuisance claims might be a situation where a client wants to sue you again for something that went wrong, it was $15,000. With a well-written contract, the lawyer is going to look and say, hey, listen, it's really time to move on. John, this is kind of where I wanted to bring you in to kind of talk to some of these folks about what you're seeing in terms of not only from you know, our clients and what they're working with you on risk management, but just the importance of contracts just in general. All right, thank you, Justin. You kind of stole my thunder, but I'm gonna to try to recoup what I can here. Okay, uh, very brief background on me. I'm a risk manager for 30, 40 years now from the environmental area, which is very heavily involved in environmental engineering and in contracts. Uh, and I'm here today to talk about contracts. 
I've been introduced to your world, I guess, about two years ago. Met Justin about a year ago. And I finally got my sea legs on this cyber coverage and this whole cyber world. And I was kind of surprised at the, uh, the similarities between the environmental world 30 years ago is exactly how the cyber world is today. So it's almost like deja vu for me. Uh, the forms were all over the, you know, the insurance policies were everywhere. Nobody understood the engineering. Nobody understood how to control it. Nobody understood how to insure it. And the losses were tremendous. And most people got out of the business. Well, through the years that it have evolved, we figured out how to engineer it, how to insure it, and how to contractually control it. And that's basically what uh, Justin and I are trying to do for your industry right now. So with that thought in mind, let's start with the, uh, the MSAs. And when I started reading them, I was kind of amazed. Um, most of what we do is to have a file ready for the attorney to go to court or to prove you're nuts to go to court to the uh, plaintiff. And that's really what our objective is here. And what that comes down to is what is the expectation of your client? What have you represented to your client that he's going to say, you didn't do it and I suffered a loss because of what you said you were going to do and you did not do it. That's really what I find. And, and the, most of the MSAs that I've been reading over the last two years were pretty much, um, uh, uh, Joe, I got this, uh, go get a cup of coffee, I'll call you when I'm done. And uh, if I do something wrong, I, you can only sue me for three months worth of services. And that really was the essence of the contract. Um, and I can tell you, when you get to court, the court's going to impose a contract on you, and it's not going to be the one that you sign with your customer. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt severely. So the big push that we have is using the MSA to help you have your customers understand and change their perception of the reality of what's happening in the cyber world today. Often the MSPs have their clients, attorneys call me because they look at our MSA that we're using and they say, are you nuts? And basically, I, they all basically get the same rap from me, which is sit down, take a breath. Uh, I'm from the Flat Earth Society, so we need to get past that. So I know they told you the world was round. They lied. Uh, in the cyber world, what was true th three years ago, what was really true, is gone. So you need to unlearn everything you knew before about the cyber exposures and reality. And let's talk about the new reality of life and what everybody needs to do to get things done. The big thing that we emphasize in the MSA is a team approach. And we use the MSA as a teaching tool, as a sales tool between the MSP and their client. We really want to educate the client as to the reality of cyber. I call it the birds and bees of cyber. To have your client ignorant to the incredible danger of being in a cyber world is negligence and immoral almost, in my opinion. You really, you are the professionals. You have to educate them on what needs to be done, how to do it, how to go about it. Now, you can't make them do that. But I think there is a moral obligation on you to explain it, detail it. And if they refuse it, they can sign off on it. But if we go to court, we can go to the judge. We had the conversation, judge. Here's the contract. Here's what they accepted. Here's what they rejected. So we tried to write a contract that basically keeps you out of court because I, I call it a, a, a mountain too high. Attorneys want to make money. Uh, at the end of the day, if they see they're going to be chasing a very difficult dollar, they're not going to want to do it. If it's uh, don't worry, I got this guy kind of contract, they'll surely take the case because they know they're going to win. There's nothing, it's totally indefensible. We try to make you guys defensible. Some of the other things that, that I've noted in, on that line, if I go to certain websites, um, and I look at the, the offerings of the various MSPs, I often see that part of the services are to prevent and eliminate incredible exposures. I mean, the, he's going he's gonna to prevent people accessing your system. Your system is, he will eliminate any compromises for your system. That is your representation to your client 
on the website to which the attorney in court is going to pull up your website and say, well, excuse me, you say you prevent and eliminate these things. And here we are with my customer having a $2 million loss because you in fact did not prevent or eliminate. So that's why the words that you use in your contracts and at your websites, you have to be extremely careful. And again, I bring it back to the perception we have. We don't eliminate or prevent anything as MSPs. Now, as the IT member of your business team, Mr. Customer, we're a clog in your machine. Us working in concert as a team can help to reduce the probability and the severity if something were to happen. And that's really what the MSA now as a teaching tool is trying to get your clients to understand. We want them to know what you're doing, how you're doing it, and how their interaction with you and when you're not there is incredibly critical. So what's going to happen at the end of the day to their exposures and to the ultimate reality of whether they survive or not. And that's really what this comes down to in most cases. I forget the exact statistics, but most people in fact do not survive a severe cyber attack on their companies. It's just the way, way it goes, because it's that bad. Okay, so part of that in the MSA, we wanna really clearly identify the business relationship. And, and this is one way we, 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 we're different than most other folks. I believe the MSA should be the business relationship. You talk about who you are, how you're going to do what you do in very general terms, how you get paid. Most importantly, who's responsible, who's not responsible, who's going to do something if something happens, what are our limits of liability if something happens, what, Mr. Customer, do you need to do? to protect yourself in the event something going wrong. In which case we have, we generally impose uh, insurance obligations on our clients in the MSA, because uh, it's, it's a very critical thing going on right now. And that's what I have the argument I have with the attorneys all the time is, well, you, you know, you have professional liability, that's what, that's what it's all about. And my retort to the attorneys is, okay, uh, and, and you guys should be listening to this because this is the perception again they're making you the insurance company. And I told two attorneys, I said, okay, I got it. So you're telling me that your client doesn't need to buy cyber insurance because in fact, the MSP is providing that coverage for them. And the answer is, oh, no, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. Well, you just told me he doesn't need to buy it because the MSP has it. Well, of course he needs to buy it. I said, okay, so we're in total agreement. And that's the end of the conversation. Because when you called out on them, and I usually tell them, if you want to give me a letter to that effect that I can put in my file, I'd be very comfortable. Believe me, I've never received a letter because I know to be hung out to dry. But what it does is it stops the objections to the customer buying appropriate insurance for his own activities. Because again, if something goes wrong, maybe you were negligent and maybe it was to a certain degree. And as I tell the attorneys and the clients, we're going to negotiate this or we're going to have this conversation for three years in court, at which point your business is gone on the hope that you're going to get some money out of me that may be left over from the million dollars that I carry, inclusive of all the other 40 other customers I have that are suing me. And there's no pot of gold at the end of that, that rainbow. And the bottom line is in the event of a loss, and this isn't any business, and I've been doing this for a long time. I've, I've, shown up, I've shown up with some very large checks and never once did they say, oh, look at the name on the check. They only said to me, oh, that's a nice number. The point being, they want a check. They don't care whose name is on it. I don't want it to be your name. That's our goal. We are risk managing our people and part of the risk management process is having our MSPs work the risk management process through to their clients. So when something goes wrong and something happens, we've got a plan of action. We all know what we're going to do. We know what the funding sources are. It's like I, I tell these, the attorneys, with their own insurance, 
if something happens on a Sunday, Monday morning, they're going to have lawyers, Bitcoin, forensic people at no expense to them, loss of business income on Monday morning, as opposed to calling us and saying, I think we got a problem. We're going to sue you. Okay. I'll see you in three years. Believe me, it's very, it's very sales effective. And the bottom line, as I tell all these people, we're doing this, not that we survive as a, your MSP, because if we survive and you die or your company dies, I lose a client. We want us both to survive the event and working together, putting the proper controls in place, we can accomplish that. So far, it's been good. There's a little resistance up front, but what we, the feedback we've had, and if it's properly done with the MSA, as a sales tool, I'm saying to them, and they are getting the feedback, well, you know, nobody ever told me this before. Well, that's true, but that doesn't alter the reality of you basically going out of business if something goes wrong. And I tell them to tell them, so when the next competitor comes in here to take over my business from you, see if he has this conversation with you. And if he doesn't, I kick him to the curb because he either doesn't know what he's talking about or doesn't care. Because if he knows what he's talking about, he's going to know he has an obligation to tell you about how severe things are out here and the controls you can implement independent of the MSP to protect yourself. So we're getting insulation, insulating layers of protection for your client, for you, and f even for your insurance companies. Because being from the loss control engineering side of insurance from many years ago, we were always taught you want to address a problem as close to the source of the problem as, prob as, as possible. You don't want to make four phone calls to solve an issue. You want one number to call. Get it done, get it done fast, get it corrected, move on. And that's, we are, we are setting our MSP clients clients with a clear path of what to do when something happens, funding mechanisms, what they need to survive the event. And that's, that's really what we're, what we're going for. And it's working. In, in addition to some of the representations, again, in the MSA, which I don't think it belongs, a lot of people go into detail about what they're going to do. And I'm going to do this quarterly, and I'm going to do that kind of a survey, and I'm going to do this which is all sounds well and good until you don't do it. And we recently had a court case come across the desk where the, the attorney said just that. You were coming in for quarterly meetings to discuss, you know, what security measures you were putting in place, what else we needed to do, provide us with training. It was never done. Again, it's defenseless because you said you were going to do it in the contract. You have to be very careful what you put in your contracts. And again, I don't believe it belongs in an MSA because an MSA is a business relationship. If you don't pay me, I charge you 12% interest, those kind of things. Actual physical services should be reserved for the SOW in which you will detail exactly what, what's happening here. Um, I'm, if I'm running over on time, forgive no, John, me. I think, you're, I think before we put him to sleep though, we, I'll move on because I told him we keep him for 20 minutes, but okay. I just wanted, and hopefully the people on the call, you, know, you can see the importance of the contracts. Hopefully we shed a little bit of light on what we see in terms of claims. Uh, as John alluded to, I think a great, you know, and Steve hit a, a nail or was, was talking about, you know, financials, financials, financials. You want a good revenue generating activity, you know, demand your client carry cyber because there was just an article in the Wall Street Journal that a bunch of cyber carriers said, you know what, we're tired of you using the cyber crime provision in your policy. You don't get 2FA on your email. You don't get cyber anymore. So the carriers now are starting to dictate to your clients what coverages they need, or I'm sorry, what security they need in place in order to achieve a policy. And we've had a lot of our clients report back that, yeah, they've had to take out that inaccessible or that uh, backup that's inaccessible from the network. Yeah, they've had to, you know, put the uh, uh, APT or ATP, I forget which one it is, on the, the Office 365, right? So those type of things, it's a good revenue generating activity and allows you to mushroom at the accounts. So I'll keep this real quick and... Uh, John, I don't know if I can turn. There we go. The last one, and then we can open this up to questions. I just wanted to point out some of the common claims that we've seen, you know, here in 2020. Uh, the first one being network security failures, i.e. the ransomware attack against MSPs, or, you know, you leave a port open at a client site or something like that, and they suffer a network security failure. Uh, the second one we see is, is client data loss, uh, whether it's due to, you know, the backup not working appropriately, stuff not being backed up, even though it looked like it was. Uh, the third being a, a rogue employee or a staff mistake. 
Um, you know, it, it, the rogue employee, uh, I'm surprised at the number of claims that we've seen over the last maybe two years that, ha that have to do with that. Um, so, you know, making sure again, that you got a policy that will cover the actions of the rogue employee, breach a contract, and also make sure that you got coverage for your vendor. So if the vendors screw up, you know, in the definition of who an insured is, does it pick up that exposure or does it stop with you? Um, so Steve, I'm sorry, I tried to hustle through the, that last slide. And, um, you know, I, I think we've taken up everybody's time enough. So if you want to open up to Q and A, feel free. Uh, absolutely. Great job guys, both for both of you. And we have several questions. Uh, one of the ones that, that Justin, you hit on it, but I need to go further. So you're saying all e and policies are not the same and are not suitable? Correct. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, like I said, uh, I was reviewing one for a, a, now a client, but a prospect on the, on the West Coast. And again, not only did he not have the first party cyber insuring agreement, so, you know, that would include coverage for cyber extortion, uh, forensics, if you have to use it, uh, system business interruption, if their system goes down, uh, to, you know, bricking coverage to replace computer hardware. But they also on their policy had what was called a failure. It was, it was an, kind of a nasty exclusion, but a failure to backup exclusion, which basically said, the carrier was telling them, if the backup doesn't work and the client sues you because of costs they had associated with recreating that data, don't come knock on our door. We're not going to pay. Wow. One of the questions posted, and, and just to, so you know, we have a couple of people here from north of the border, so to speak. So there might be some differences and nuances, or you may not even know the answer for, for the Canadian members. But um, someone asked for cyber liability E&O coverage. Would you suggest a percentage of annual revenue or maybe some other factor or formula to figure out what you need in coverage? That's a great question. I mean, that, you know, again, going back to what I mentioned a little bit earlier in the presentation, you know, a ma majority, 60% of that is probably going to be on our job is going through and saying, well, are you 90% hardware sales or are you 90% managed services? Because there's a difference. Are you 90% healthcare and financial or are you 90% bakeries? It's going to be a difference. Do you have a private cloud where you're in charge of maintaining the system or do you use a third party like Azure AWS where you hand the client the terms and conditions via your SAO and you charge them you know, a management fee? Uh, how many endpoints are you in charge of? So it's a tough question without seeing something to just you know, kind of give you a blanket answer. Um, but you know, part of that, again, we, we mentioned a little on the call is you know, MSP's gotta go through how big are your clients you're supporting? You know, because I don't really care about the number of clients because, you know, one hedge fund equals more than probably 10 bakeries, even though you're going to look like, oh, you got 10 times the clients. Well, you know, not only the, in terms of the industry they're in, but the size of that hedge fund, that's a lot more riskier than, to, to us than, than somebody that's got, you know, the 10 bakery clients. So, um, you know, kind of, again, to answer your question, there is no quote unquote percentage. Um, and at the end of the day, if insurance is the only solution to your risk management, you're going to need 20, 30, 40 million dollars that you're not going to want to buy in terms of what the premium you get for it. So that's why we got to start working on other things like critical action letters, waiver letters. We got to mitigate the risk. We got to transfer it. Um, you know, we've got to do some other things than just insurance. Fantastic. I think you touched on this, but the question came up after. So I, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Uh, the question was, would you consider a $1 million policy with a $1 million umbrella sufficient coverage? So I know that's a pretty broad question too. But. Yeah, that, no, that's a great question. Usually an umbrella, when, you know, when people will send that in, the umbrella, when you read the policy form, it actually sits over the general liability, auto liability, workers' comp. It, it has an exclusion for, for, for cyber e and um, so usually if you have a million dollar policy, again, depending on the carrier, I don't see the need to get an umbrella. You just go back to that carrier and say, Hey, instead of one, I want 2 million. Now, if you start getting into situations where, you know, we've got clients that might want 10 million, well, depending on the size of the MSP, the carrier might say, Hey, you know what? I'm stopping at five mil and you got to go purchase what they call excess e &O. So again, it's a version of, of, like, of an umbrella coverage. It's just called excess e &O, And basically what it does is it, it takes the insuring agreements on that second policy and institutes the same coverage. So if something goes wrong, it takes the limits from five mil to 10 mil. Gotcha. Yeah, let me, let me say John company, uh, this, this comes up in often a lot of different scenarios, but if you want to stop the clock on these guys, when they offer you an umbrella policy over your professional, 
just tell them to um, provide evidence that it's follow a form over your professional liability, which means the, the excess coverage or the umbrella literally has the same language as the primary errors and emissions coverage. But I believe Justin's right, just buy higher limits under your own policy because you'll have a better, better chance of getting the larger claims paid. Right. Someone, another question that was posted is, um, do release of liabilities actually work in court for a client who turns down necessary security services? And he goes on to say, is there admission of guilt by continuing to service the client even though they don't have proper security services in place? John, you want to take that? Every case is different, and that's why we kind of try to reinforce on multiple levels when we tell people this kind of stuff. It's um, we actually have provisions in our in our MSA disclaiming any kind of security service unless specified in the SAO. Uh, we talk about third-party provider obligations that's in the MSA reinforced in the SAO, reinforced at the website. So we tend to when we get into these situations where there's something going on that's objectionable. We uh, will tell the client flat out uh, and tell them basically in our MSA now has a provision that in the event you don't accept our critical recommendations, we will provide you with a letter indicating what those violations are and that you have in fact denied the corrective action and have assumed liability and will indemnify us and hold us harmless against damages as a result of your lack of activity on our recommendations. So the so language is strong. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think it, I, again, you know, the courts do what the courts do. I think they'll look at the overall, I mean, they'll look at your MSA, they can look at your SOW, they can look, but the consistency we're trying to get is that throughout the MSA, the SOW, and the website, they, they all work very much in concert, reinforcing the positives and the negatives obligations and duties of you and of the client. And that's just now just being reinforced by the letter. The letter doesn't stand by itself. It's actually reconfirming everything else that we've presented them in the MSA, the SOW and the website. John, the one thing that I heard you say, and I think that most of us miss out on is the language needs to be strong. You know, I think, I think most of us tend to say it, in a way that is a little lighter. We don't want to push our customer to leave us or think we're, we're saying something bad to them. But, but I think what you said is make it strong, be definitive, and actually state that they're accepting and indemnifying you from responsibility of anything that you deem came because you don't have this in place. Is that fair? Right. Absolutely. And, and again, this is a teaching moment your client probably has no understanding of the critical position that he's in. Your obligation is to teach them that, educate them. You can't, I'm, I've been a risk manager for a long time. I tell people all the time, I can tell you the solution. I'm not going to write the check. If you don't want to pay for the solution, you're on your own. Now, generally I will walk away from that client. So you, know, you guys do whatever you want to do, but I tell all my clients, if you know more about what I'm doing than I do, you don't need me. And I leave and we terminate the relationship. Uh, if, if it's that egregious, I'm not sure you'd want to retain a customer that's that, that is that in fact, that negligence. So, but that's, that becomes a business decision. Right. But as a risk manager, I'd walk away. And Steve, one other thing is, is you know, we, we, what we see is, and I remind clients, it's like, you know, our, our attorneys are pretty good, right? But when you're shutting people down, their attorneys are pretty good too. So, right. you know, you better believe they're going to come at you. So if you don't have the conversation and deal with it now, you're going to be forced to deal with it when it happens. So you pick with it. You're going to have to deal with it either way. It's just, is it now or later? That's a and great I can point. tell you, having these conversations before the loss is much easier than after. When I think, you know, sometimes we ask these questions and we think of it as, oh, I'm just going to send this letter. And if they don't go with it, I'm going to send them a termination letter, right? Or, or not, whatever we do. But the truth is this should be conversational, right? Now, now it's time to reach out and say, we need to schedule a meeting. This is pretty serious. I'm not sure you're understanding the severity of it. Um, we're going to have to make a decision whether we want to continue with you or not. But certainly let's get together and have a conversation. And I think if you say it in those ways, 
you're, you're kind of hitting them in the head a little bit and, and saying, this isn't just some letter I sent you. And you're providing superior service. Right. And, and, I, I, and again, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a sales opportunity because you're going to also sell a solution. Right. And Steve, I think one other thing you can't lose sight of is, you know, big picture, big company wise. I mean, MSPs on this call, you're the CIO of Verizon. Your client's the CEO of Verizon. You know, you have an obligation, a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the organization's protected. Because in the real world, if that happens, and the CEO finds out, oh, the CIO at American Express was doing A, B, C, D, and E, and we weren't, you're fired. In our world, you get fired and sued. That's a good point. That's a good point. I've got two questions that I think I need to remind everyone before I ask the questions of what your business is. While you're on this call to provide, provide valuable information related to cybersecurity insurance, that's not what you do for a living. What you do for a living is actually sell this stuff, right? And, and, and I think sometimes you do such a good job, Justin and John, of, of educating us when you join us that people forget that. So the reason I say that is both of these questions, I think, bring you towards the consulting side and not necessarily the insurance sales side, but I'll let you answer. Um, what one, the first one is, are there templates for the MSA that can be customized to our particular business that you have? And the other, I'm going to give you both of them, is do you offer MSA review services? If so, what does it typically cost to have an MSA reviewed and updated? Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head, Steve. I mean, unfortunately, we're not in the consulting business. Um, you know, th this is just a perk, you know, that by working with TechRug is, you know, hope we share this intellectual property and these techniques with our clients. I mean, that's what we do all day, every day. So that's our job. You know, we really look for MSPs that are more than just insurance and want to adopt the risk transfer, risk mitigation techniques that's the MSP that we want to work with just because going through court after court case and lawsuit after lawsuit, if you aren't doing those things, you're going to be in big trouble because we've had, unfortunately, we've had the tool set compromises. I've had 11 of them for our clients in the last almost two years. All 11 are still standing. I think part of the reason they're still, they're still standing is insurance wasn't their only solution, right? They were doing these things that we're talking about and they're all still going. A hundred percent. And I think for those that were asking that question, um, Bradley Gross, who is an attorney that really focuses on the, this industry, um, anyone that needs contact info, reach out to me uh, via email um, or those that are members via Teams, and I'll gladly connect you. But he focuses on the language of your MSAs and reviewing them and making sure they're accurate. And he's phenomenal um, in that light. Um, I don't know if you're going to like this question, Justin, but you know, I, this seems like a buying signal question. <laughs> would, would Justin or John please speak a bit about how they would like us to engage them for insurance? Um, now, now it adds and consulting, but maybe they were typing that before we finish that last piece. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess the consulting again probably comes with it, but, um, and Steve, you correct me if I'm wrong, because again, we don't have access, but I think our information might be on the site. If not, I could give people all the honest. I just want to keep this more informative and less about TechRub, but I think our information is on the site. So first off, your, your, your contact information is right on the screen right now and will be emailed to everybody. For our members, if you go to the resource network uh, link on our SharePoint, TechRug is listed there as well. Um, uh, Felicia, just, just, just email Justin and he'll connect you with the right person. Thank you for asking that again. Um, so that's fantastic. I, I've got one more, and this is more commentary than question, Justin, but for our members that are on here, I think this will resonate. For those that are not members, maybe it's a reason to reach out to us and, and talk, but Justin, you talked about not following a standard like NIST is problematic, and I had a big grin on my face when you said that, because for the last year plus, um, MSP Ignite has really pushed something called secure outcomes to our members. There are several members on this call that have been part of the steering committee for that and part of the content building committee for that. But it's all based on NIST standards and, and following them and understanding them and using them in your business and not just stacking a bunch of security tools up and saying we're now cybersecurity experts. Can you expand a little about, about the whole idea of following standards and why? 
Yeah, I mean, again, you know, you could pick any industry, right? Whether it's medical, whether it's uh, an accountant that follows the AICPA, you know, whether it's an architect or engineer that designs or builds a bridge in your community, um, you know, they are all following a standard, right? In terms of a treatment plan or how to design a specific uh, solution to, to whatever's trying to be accomplished. And, you know, in, in our dealings with, you know, claims and what we see on our side is, the, uh, the attorneys are going to ask you, Mr. MSP, why did you come to the solution that you came to for our client? If you can't point to the government or a standard saying, well, you know what? The government told us. It needs to be more of, like John was saying, a team concept. The government tells us what we need to have in place. That's a lot easier than saying, well, you know, I thought based on what they were doing in 2019, this would be a good college try. It's not going to get us to first base, right? And so, Again, do I think your clients, do I live in La La Land or, you know, that I think all your clients are going to follow NIST down to the letter of the law? We're chasing infinity, right? But does that absolve you of the liability not recommending that they do it? It doesn't. If okay. I could add there too, the, yep. the, pr the premise of the insurance and the claims and your liability is negligence. So if we have something to measure your negligence against, being at NIST in this case, if you achieve the NIST standard, there is no negligence, there is no case. It's not arbitrary. Like, uh, you know, I learned in college, you're a dumb kid, give me somebody that agrees with you kind of a situation, footnote it, you know, and we have it more pronounced in our, in our forms uh, that, you know, w this is all based on n compliance with NIST. That is the standard. It's not arbitrary, it's stated. If we achieve NIST, and you don't because of your own volition, that's up to you. But if we achieve it, we in fact are not negligent by definition. So therefore not subject to suit. I mean, we'll be subject to suit, but we're gonna win. Don, you said you said in our pre-call, I might scare some people out of the MSP business. I, I, <laughs> you, you, were, you were getting very close to the line on that, on that one. But you know, that's, that's fantastic. Again, those of you that are members, the, the Secure Outcomes team and group has done a phenomenal job of taking NIST policies and, and really tweaking them to a way that'll get you a good head start with this and help you with insurance mitigation. So you really should be tuning in, uh, looking at those webinars. Those are not on the YouTube channel. They're for members only. Um, they are in our SharePoint. And if you don't know how to get there, shame on you, but reach out to me anyway, and I promise I won't give you a hard time. So thank you all for tuning into this today. I certainly hope the information you received was actionable and helpful. For those not already participating in one of our peer groups, please reach out to us so we can discuss the value along with our money back guarantee. Uh, Justin and John, thank you very much for your time and expertise. As always, extremely helpful. My pleasure. Thanks, Steve.